handout. If not, someone's making some copies. So there should be a little handout. I'm tired. Let's, let's go to sleep. I, I know. Actually, one of my, my brothers was up here. Well, he's here. He's in Kurt Lane, so I got to see him yesterday, so that was kind of nice. He's got to work all week, but so I may not see him again, but at least we had a party yesterday in the evening together. I, I don't get to see them very much. <laughs> he, he'll probably never be back for another 10 years. Um, well, he has no reason to come, right? Why do you want to come see me? You know, that's not very <laughs> good reason to leave your family and kids. <laughs> okay, so we're going to be back in Colossians tonight, chapter 1. We'll finish out this chapter and then hopefully, you know, keep moving pretty briskly into chapter 2 next week. Then we'll be through the doctrinal portion and we'll move on in chapters 3 to 4 to the application. But of course, there's application throughout. We'll make some tonight. If you, uh, there's, I noticed there's also, you know, we have this little thing you can, door hangers you can put in your neighborhood, and there's also a list out there as far as what neighborhood you might have gone through. So I would encourage this because I think that there's a lot of believers who need to get re-engaged, and some of them probably became disenchanted with their local churches during this situation. And so, you know, they really need... That And a lot of people are saying, well, we can just do digital church, right? That's fine. We're still getting the word, and that's sufficient, but it's not sufficient. Uh, Video and live stream and all that, it can be a supplement, but it can't be a replacement. A supplement, but not a substitute, let's say that, for face-to-face teaching and face-to-face fellowship, right? So it's easier because you just sit there in your pajamas and drink your Nespresso or whatever, but it's not, it's not conducive to spiritual growth because exercise of one's gifts in the body amongst believers is an essential component of spiritual growth. So it's, it's not going to work. It'll end in failure and more erosion of Christianity. Okay, that's the last thing we need in America. Further erosion of Christianity and its influence. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and we'll get in fellowship with the Lord if we need to, and then we'll study the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are gracious, that you have done on our behalf what we could never do in Christ, and that he is the preeminent one, supreme over the universe the one who created everything and the one who reconciled all things to himself and especially believers so that we can, we have moved from a position of hostility against you to one of friendship and uh, we stand in the beloved and as such are beloved by you. And we pray that we would hear the Apostle Paul and hear the Spirit of God through the Apostle Paul as he instructs us regarding his ministry and his chief goal in ministry and I thank you that, you know, everyone here uh, realizes that, you know, the thing that we have as a a first priority in the Christian life is to learn Christian doctrine relative to the Lord Jesus Christ, to grow spiritually into maturity, because there's a day of evaluation for every one of us at the judgment seat of Christ, and we do want to stand before you at that point holy and blameless and uh, uh, beyond reproach. And so we ask, Lord, that we would pursue righteousness, persevere in the truths of the gospel, and not give up hope, and not turn aside from that which you've called us to. And uh, ask that for every individual in here, that we pursue you to the end of our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, so far, Colossians. Chapter 1, the first two verses are simply a greeting, fairly standard for the Apostle Paul, but the mention of Timothy is a little unique, so he was co-author with Paul of this epistle to the little town of Colossa. The believers there, who we'll find out tonight, were of Gentile composition. There weren't any Jewish believers there yet. Verses 4 to 8, 
or three to eight, thanksgiving to God. Paul gives thanks to God for the progress of the Colossians. Verses nine to 14, prayer for the Colossians. Further progress, maturity. And last week's verses 15 through 20, the beautiful two stanza hymn and transition between those two stanzas concerning the exalted, supreme Christ, the one who's the creator, in whom all things are created, by whom all things are created, who, for whom all things are created, the one who sustains the universe, the one who's the head of the church, and the one who's reconciled all creation to himself through his cross work. So this book has a lot of themes and it brings them you know, all together and bounces around and comes back to those same themes repeatedly. So verse 21 is where we'll start tonight and Paul is going to transition there from verse 20 where God has reconciled all things to himself through Christ and now he's going to look back. See verse 21, he's looking back, their former life. And in verse 22 he's going to contrast that with their new life, being reconciled to God. And he's purposefully using some of these terms, I'll point out, to assault the Gnostic heresy that was encroaching at Colossae. So Paul is sort of in the background addressing the danger that they were facing, the false teaching, right? So verse 21, and this verse should sound a lot like Ephesians 2.1, because he wrote these books about the same time. So if you know Ephesians 2.1, you'll say, well, this sounds a lot like that, and that's, that's correct. He says, and although you were formerly alienated, and hostile, in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister." So let's look at verse 21, the words, although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind. There's two things there about the Colossian believers. First of all, we see that they were Gentiles. You say, well, it doesn't say that, but it does say that under the term alienated. Alienated was a term that refers to their relationship to the Jews. They were alienated from the Jews, and the Jews had spiritual privileges before the cross, right? Right? Since these are Gentiles, they were alienated from those spiritual privileges. This is the exact same word Paul used in Ephesians 2.12, where he also applied it to Gentiles who were, quote, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and with it all their unique spiritual privileges. So this is the, before the cross, but now that these Gentiles in verse 22 had been reconciled to God through the cross, they had access to the exact same spiritual privileges as Jews because they're all members of the same body, the body of Christ, right? And verse 18 told us or mentioned the, the body. So that is definitely in Paul's mind. That's the first thing we know about the Colossians formerly. They were alienated from the spiritual privileges of Israel. Secondly, we know that they were hostile in mind and the word hostile here refers to their relationship to God. Okay? They were hostile in mind toward God. It's the same word used by Paul in Romans 5.10 when he says that we, while we were yet enemies of God, right? hostile to God, Christ died for us. Okay? Now this word mind is uh, dianoia. It refers to mental disposition toward someone. In other words, they were hostile to God in their mind. You say, but how do you know that, Paul? Because you can't get inside their mind. Well, he's going to explain how he knows at the end of verse 21 as he talks about their evil deeds that emanate from the, the minds. That's where evil begins. It starts where? It starts in the mind, right? Then it has an outworking in, in our deeds, and that will be his explanation. But they were, first of all, then alienated from Israel. That's their relationship to Israel. And then they were hostile to God. That's their relationship to God. And um, this is, right here, a assault on the Gnostics in a way because the mind to Gnostics was pure spirit. And therefore, the mind in Gnosticism was, was good, inherently good. 
But Paul says, no, 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 no. (laughs) In your mind, this immaterial component of humanity, you were hostile to God. So the immaterial things like the mind and the soul are not good. They're not inherently good. And then the last phrase, like we said in verse 21, tells us how Paul knew that they were hostile in mind toward God, at least one of the evidences, is that they were engaged in evil deeds, and that manifested their hostile mindset toward God. But, verse 22, by contrast, he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. Now there's the word reconciled again. We saw it a few verses before, verse 20. We saw reconciliation. This word means to move from a position of hostility to one of friendship, right? The greatness of being reconciled, right? At the moment of faith in Christ, that you're no longer hostile toward God, you're no longer an enemy of God, but you are the friend of God. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing that God has done for us. And this reconciliation, of course, of course, occurred in Christ's fleshly body through death. Note the fleshly body. That's not, you, you, you would say, that's not very common. I don't really see Paul saying the fleshly body of Christ. You know, he might say the body or he died or something like that. But see how he's very specific about mentioning the flesh here? He's obviously referring to the material part of Christ, his humanity, right? His true body. And then, again, this is an indirect assault on the Gnostic notion that, you know, anything that's material is inherently evil. <laughs> but that's not so, okay? Because here's Christ's body, his fleshly body, and it wasn't evil at all. It had no sin in it at all. And it's through his death that God reconciled us to him. So he's taking another stab at it there, at Gnosticism. And it's this whole concept of Gnostic, the Gnostic Christ, eventually came down in church history into another heresy known as Docetism. And Docetism was the idea that the form of Jesus Christ when he was on earth was just a human form. It was but it was not real humanity. It was an illusion. And so there's the docetic Christ that was held to by Christians uh, in the early church or by certain people in the early church. And, and Paul, obviously, while he didn't know about docetism, he, in the strongest terms, does point out that if anyone ever comes along in church history and says that, no, 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 Jesus was not a real human. He didn't really have a human body because we know material things like the body are evil, inherently, he says, he knocks that out right here. And so that anybody who comes along and says that Christ didn't have a human body, a real fleshly body, is, is to be anathema, right? That's, that's an anathema teaching, okay? It was, in fact, the fleshly body that died, and through that death, we are reconciled to God. We're no longer enemies, but we're friends. That means God's on your side, by the way. <laughs> that he's not out to get you, right? Um, that he loves you, he has a perfect plan for your life, and uh, even when you disobey him, guess what? He still loves you. Okay? He still loves you. Now, the, rec- the goal of the reconciliation, middle of verse 22, the goal, or purpose, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, Okay, here's more language that we see from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 1 verse 4, He chose us in Christ from before the foundation of the world to be what? Holy and blameless. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 27, uh, in the analogy of Christ and the church with husband and wife, it says in Christ to uh, present the church before himself holy and blameless. Uh, So it's the same exact language from Ephesians, and he was writing this at the same time. He wrote it from the same prison cell with the same people in the prison and sent it by way of the same messenger, Tychicus. So these letters are written at the same time, virtually. And so he's using the same language. Now, some people think that um, what this is saying is, you know, he reconciled us in the fleshly body through death so that ultimate sanctification, all believers will be presented before him holy and blameless. 
I mean, that's true in a sense. I mean, we're going to be resurrected and be with Christ. But the, big, the idea of ultimate sanctification, you know, your final sanctification, getting a resurrection body, doesn't seem to be present in this context. Um, a different context seems in view. Charlie Bing, who probably some of you know, uh, makes a good case that being present before him, holy and blameless and beyond reproach, refers to being presented at the judgment seat of Christ in this condition when we're evaluated for rewards. So the goal, what's really in view is experiential sanctification, okay, not ultimate sanctification. Remember, experiential is talking about your phase two, anything from the moment you believed in Christ until the moment you're gone out of this life, Right? So the goal of our experiential sanctification is that when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, we are presented before him, as it says here, and found to be holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So that's the goal of reconciliation. Okay? At the moment you believe in Christ, you're reconciled to God through Christ, and we are now, the goal is to live a productive Christian life, to grow to spiritual maturity, so that when we are presented before him at the judgment seat of Christ, what, is, what are we found to be? We're found to be holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Now, so that means there's no guarantee that we're going to, at the judgment seat of Christ, be presented in this condition, okay? And the reason is because verse 23 gives us some conditions that must be met for us to be presented in that, in that way, Okay, verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. So there's a condition here, so that when we arrive at the judgment seat of Christ, we're calculated to be holy and blameless and so forth. That condition is continuing in the faith. We might call that perseverance, right? We persevere to the end. But the perseverance here to the end is related to rewards, not to final salvation or proving one's salvation. So, of course, there's Reformed and Lordship, you know, Calvinist teachings that say that we have to persevere until the end of our life in the faith in order to really be saved. But the context here is being presented before him at the judgment seat of Christ for rewards, not, not for salvation. So the Colossians, of course, obviously were already saved. How could you continue in the faith if you weren't? right? <laughs> One of the conditions for continuing in the faith is that you're actually in the faith, first of all. So it's pretty obvious that this is talking to believers and about their need to continue in the faith as Christians, firmly established and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. So it's incumbent on every believer to do this. It's, it's, it's possible for a believer to not do this, to not continue in the faith, to turn aside from the faith. It's possible for a believer to move away from the gospel, the hope of the gospel. We see people doing that in the book, like Hymenaeus and Alexander who rejected the resurrection, yet they were believers, um, but they got deceived and they went into false doctrine. So it's possible to not continue. But if you don't continue, of course, you won't receive the favorable verdict of verse, 21, of verse 22 of being presented holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Okay. So put bluntly then, basically what he's saying here in verse 22 and 23 is that, look, God reconciled us to himself in Christ so that a certain goal would be acquired or attained. And that is that we be presented for him at the judgment seat of Christ holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Okay, but this is only con going to uh, be attained if you continue in the faith. You're not moved away from the gospel, the hope of the gospel. And so as we always say, salvation, right? Salvation is a free gift of God. It's received through faith alone in the gospel. But rewards are earned from a lifetime of faithfulness to the hope of the gospel, right? So there are two distinct things, salvation and, and rewards. Now, as far as the details there in verse 23, since I was just giving an overview there, continue in the faith, obviously some form of perseverance, persevering in the faith. The faith is here is, has the definite article, so it's talking about Christian doctrine, that you continue in Christian doctrine. Now, do all believers continue in Christian doctrine? Heck, some of them never even got started. I mean, they got the doctrine of the gospel down, they heard the gospel they believed, and after that, who knows? You know, it's pretty shallow for the most part. 
But this is what the believer needs to do to continue to grow to maturity. We have to attend to doctrine. We have to continue in the doctrine. Now, there are three phrases in this verse that describe what we might call a mature believer, because this passage does use a word for mature later on. That's what Paul's all about. He's about maturing believers. Okay? The first one is, the first phrase is firmly established. That's a description of a strong doctrinal believer, right? This uh, terminology, this imagery comes from a strong tower. Okay? Firmly established refers to a strong tower. So what is a mature believer like? He's like a strong tower. Okay? The second phrase is the word, well, word, not phrase, is steadfast. This is, steadfast is the imagery of a foundation. So a mature believer who is steadfast, he's like a foundation. He's solid. He's immovable. He's not going to move away from the doctrine. He's not going to move away from the hope of the gospel. That's the next part. Third, the believer who has not moved away from the hope of the gospel doesn't allow his Hope to be shifted, okay, away from that of the gospel. What is the hope of the gospel? Hope is always something future, because if you have it already, it's no longer something you hope for. You don't hope for what you see, right? You already got that. So hope is always something future, and here it's, a, it's the hope of the resurrection. Part of the gospel is the resurrection. It's the death on one hand, and then it's the resurrection. And uh, that's our hope, is the resurrection. So a mature believer will keep his focus on the future resurrection. Because that's our hope. That's our hope. I mean, that's what we want, right? I mean, that's what, we, that's what we're certain is going to take place. So, what, what are some of the things you can do to ensure a favorable verdict at the judgment seat of Christ? You continue in sound doctrine. You be steadfast, immovable like a foundation. And not, not move away from the hope of the resurrection. See? Those are essential components in the Christian way of thinking that help you persevere. Help you keep going forward. And yeah, you fall, but what do you do when you fall? You get back up and you keep walking. You sin and what do you do? You confess your sin and you get back in fellowship and you keep walking, right? You keep moving ahead. Okay? That's the concept of persevering. And you do this to the end of your life, and that'll ensure a good verdict at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's the whole point of reconciliation, is to meet that goal, to acquire that end. Middle of verse 23, having mentioned the gospel there, uh, Paul now mentions the extent of the proclamation of the gospel, just how wide a sphere the gospel will be proclaimed. He says, which was proclaimed. Notice how it's translated there as a past tense was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. That can be a bit confusing because Paul wrote this about like AD 61 or 62, and are you telling me really, Paul, that the gospel spread all the way to North America, South America, Australia, China? Okay. Um, by AD 61 or 62, there are actually some people who do believe that on the basis of this verse, but this is what we call a proleptic aorist. Proleptic aorist. A proleptic heiress is a predictive prophecy of what will happen with regard to the gospel. That is, that it will be proclaimed in all creation under heaven. So it eventually will stretch to North America, South America, Australia, China, etc. and so forth. And look, you and I are here today, and the gospel of grace has come to us. Okay, wherever you may have been. I was in Paris, Texas. You may have been in Spokane or Armenia or wherever you were, right? But the gospel has gone out as Paul proleptically, aristically, prophetically predicted that it would, okay? And Paul, notice the end of verse 23, he sees himself at the beginning of this gospel going out to all creation because he speaks of himself emphatically saying, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. I'm a minister of that gospel which is to be proclaimed through all of the earth. So he understood that he was part of the beginning of that process and he also understood that, hey, this process is going to continue with others until, guess what, until it does reach the whole world. Okay, This is part of the evidence of the truth of the gospel is that you and I on the other side of the world uh, have heard the gospel 
and have believed unto salvation. That's a remarkable, remarkable thing. And verses 24 to 29, now Paul wants to transition. He wants to transition from their former life, hostile to God, alienated to Israel, right, to their reconciliation. And the end of reconciliation or goal to be at the judgment seat of Christ and be a, get a favorable verdict because you persevered in the faith, right? And now he wants to transition to his ministry and why he is so driven. It's hard to find anyone in the history of the world more driven than the Apostle Paul, is it not? It, it is one of the greatest stories ever told just to read the life of the Apostle Paul. Why? Why was he so driven? So let's look at his ministry, how he got his ministry, the goal of his ministry, why he was so driven in ministry. Verse 24, he goes in to his suffering. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Uh, this is a verse that I think probably stresses a lot of Christians out <laughs> because they automatically begin to think that, well, Paul is saying that somehow Christ's work and suffering on the cross is insufficient. And how is it that Paul could say that? How is it that he could think that he could ever fill up, you know, or that Christ didn't do it all and he needed to add something to that? Um, Paul... Is, we'll answer that. Paul is saying that his ministry, first of all, led to suffering, his own personal suffering. Um, now, here's the thing. He was not suffering on behalf of the head of the body. The head of the body is Christ, right? Um, nothing can add to Christ's suffering on the cross. Okay? If it could, that would mean that what Christ did on the cross was incomplete or insufficient. But what did Christ say on the cross? At the end, just before he gave up his spirit, John 19.30, it is finished. Okay? There was nothing to be added to that. His suffering for the sin of the world was complete and finished. And no suffering we can do in our Christian life can add to his suffering to satisfy the Father. But so note that the suffering that Paul is discussing is in the middle of the verse. He says it's on behalf of the body, not the head. The head already did its suffering. But the body has some suffering to undergo, and this is which he says is the church, the body. So the suffering of the body is not complete. But Paul says, look, I do my share. See that word share? In other words, there's one, let's say, vast reservoir or allotment of suffering that the body, the church, is to undergo. And Paul says, I do my share of that vast reservoir. He didn't do all of it for the church, okay, but he did his share, see. And this fills up, he says at the end of the verse, what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. In what sense? In what sense does it fill it up? In the sense that Christ suffered as the head, okay, on behalf of the body, okay, but... He did not do the suffering of the body, the church. The church has some suffering that it must do as well. So his suffering was complete. It was complete on the, Christ, on the cross. It is finished, right? But the rest of the body throughout church history has to suffer as they carry on the gospel of Christ. And that's why we suffer. We suffer for the God. That's why Paul was suffering. That's why he was in prison at the time, right? He was suffering for the gospel of Christ. So Christ already did his suffering, his part on the cross, it's finished. Then Paul was doing his part early in church history. And we today, as we minister for Christ, we also do our part of suffering for the body, on behalf of the body. And when the body has done all of its suffering, guess what? Then the body of Christ will be complete, and it will be joined to the head, its head in heaven, right? At the rapture. Verse 25, now Paul explains that that was his suffering due to his ministry. Now he's explaining how he was, became a minister, how he got into ministry. Of this church, he says, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. Okay. Now look, uh, he says I was made a minister. In other words, I didn't have much choice, he says. 
Uh, I was on the Damascus Road. We remember the story. Christ appeared to him. He did, he did have a choice to believe or not, and he did believe, and he was justified on the road. Uh, but the thing he didn't have a choice rather to do or not was really was to be a minister. He was made a minister. He says, I was made. Now, the word minister means, um, well, what does it mean? I can always give answers, but to get them. <laughs> uh, a minister is a servant. Okay? And that's what all true ministry is. It's, it's, it's serving others, right? It's making yourself available for others to serve them in some spiritual capacity. Paul served others, we learn at the end of the verse, by preaching the word of God. That's, that's what he did. It was his preaching ministry. And he says this ministry was a stewardship. It was a stewardship from God. It was entrusted to him by God. Anytime you see a stewardship relationship in the Bible, there is always a master. There's always a steward who is given some responsibility for which he will be evaluated. Those four components. There's always a master, a steward. The steward is given a responsibility and the steward will be evaluated for how well he fulfilled his responsibility. Right? Luke 16 is a great picture. So um, he was given a specific stewardship by God, a responsibility. God's the master, of course. Paul's the steward, right? And the responsibility was to be for the benefit of others, especially to Gentile believers. Okay, Paul, Paul was the apostle to the, to the Gentiles. So he's particularly, his focus of his ministry, let's say, is to Gentiles. And his evaluation for how well he did is going to take place at the judgment seat of Christ, just like yours will and my will. Right? 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, Paul says, I run my race so as to win the prize, right? And we ought to run our race so as to win the prize, okay? We want to win. We want to go to the judgment seat of Christ. We want to receive rewards because that glorifies God. <laughs> Paul's ministry then is stated uh, at the end of the verse so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. This is a way of saying, um, oop, I forgot to, you, you got, I, I got carried away. Uh, and I'm sorry, I missed some of these slides. Okay. This is another way of saying, you know, I might fully carry out, is this idea of preaching to the whole world. Okay. And we know Paul was always trying to go farther. In the end, we think he's trying to go where? All the way west to Spain, right? <laughs> so, you know, he was trying to preach the word of God to the, to the whole world. He was highly driven. Okay, verse 26. And uh, he says this stewardship was a mystery, and then he defines this, this mystery. He says, that is the mystery, which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints. So the mystery is obviously something that's been hidden from past periods of time, past generations of time. They didn't know about it. Well, how did they not know about it? Well, because it was hidden. Um, the truth is it was hidden in God. You know, it was inaccessible. It's part of his revelation. The only way you can know it is to get inside the mind of God. And the only way you can do that is if he, he speaks it, right? So, but the good news is that now, he says, it's been manifested to his saints. Now, saints is just all believers, right? But Ephesians 3.5 gives us an additional step in this, and it says it was revealed to apostles and prophets, and through the apostles and prophets, we know that it was also made manifest to his saints, all believers. So whatever this mystery is, it's not something hidden in the Old Testament. You can't go back there and find this idea in hindsight, okay? It's not anything that could be predicted based on the Old Testament. It's just something that's completely hidden in God, until it was manifested to the apostles and prophets and to all saints in the New Testament church. And so Paul is given the stewardship to dispense of this mystery, to explain this mystery, to teach this mystery, to preach this mystery. So in verse 27, he tells us the mystery. To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is... And there it is, Christ in you. That's the, the heart and substance of the mystery. Uh, the hope of glory, okay? When it says uh, there at verse 27, to whom God willed, will just means wanted. You know, I, I, I try to stay away from the word will because people abuse that in so many ways. What's the will of God for your life? You know, shut up. 
Okay, the word just means want. Okay, quit getting all like hyper spiritual on me. It's just something God wants. Okay, God wanted to make something known. Okay, right? That's what it says. And in this stage of history, and the thing he wanted to make known was the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, Christ in you. Um, now, it is a little bit of help to say that the way this should be translated when it says the riches of the glory is really glorious wealth. Um, the glorious wealth. He wanted to make known what is the glorious wealth of this mystery. Um, but we looked up, and I showed you a week or two ago, that the word glory, one of the lexical meanings is great. It has other lexical meanings. But in this context, that's the, that's the purpose of this word. The great wealth. And that means a lot more to us. Anyway, he wanted to make known what is the great wealth of this mystery among the Gentiles. Okay? Now, what, it says that this great wealth among Gentiles is Christ in you. Or let's, let's say it different. Let's say Messiah. Messiah in you. Because Christos, it's the same thing as Messiah, right? But Messiah has such a Jewish overtones to it, right? That it becomes really striking because it's talking about a Jewish Messiah in Gentile believers. And that shocks you a little bit more than just saying Christ in you. Because we don't typically think Christ, Jew, Messiah, okay, but it is. This is a Jewish Messiah in Gentile people. Okay? And that's what the shock of it all is. And that's what the mystery was. There's nothing about that in the Old Testament. Uh, this couldn't be predicted on some basis of some prophecy in the Old Testament. The truth is, in the Old Testament, um, if you were a Gentile, could you be saved? Well, yeah. I mean, like Rahab and Ruth. I mean, there's... There's a lot of Gentiles who are saved in the Old Testament. This mystery has nothing to do with whether you could be saved or not. Gentiles have been saved for even before Jews were around. Before Abraham. <laughs> so that's nothing new. Okay, that's not a mystery. Um, what Gentiles did not have in the Old Testament, even if they were saved, like somebody like a Ruth, is they did not have equal spiritual status with Jews. They were still on the outside. They were always sort of on the fringes, right? But see, now they, you, I, we have the Messiah in us. Well, what does this mean? Messiah in you. What, what does this mean? This expression is really only used four times in the New Testament. Um, now, in you could mean something like what we find in the Great Commission. It's a sense of, I am in your midst. Remember he says, and lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. Like I'm in your midst. Remember that? It could mean something like that. Or it could mean, you know, I indwell you. In the sense, like the Holy Spirit indwells us. But really, either way, among you, in you, these are not substantially different. Okay, let me explain this. Romans 8.10 is one of the other, other three passages that talk about Christ indwelling. Romans 8.10. Okay, and the next verse, Romans 8.11, <laughs> talks about the Spirit indwelling you. Now, they, look, they both indwell you, okay? Um, Christ indwells you, the Spirit indwells you. I'll do my best to to explain this, and I may, may, may fail, but I'll try. Um, in Romans 8.10, he says, you know, Christ is in you so that while your, your body is as good as dead, but the spirit, your spirit is alive to God because of his righteousness. Okay? Look, the, what indwells, Christ indwells us, and therefore his righteousness indwells us. But the way that his righteousness is made seen through us is by living by the Spirit. Okay, when we live by the Spirit, Christ's righteous life is reproduced through us. When we live by the Spirit, Christ's righteous life, which is indwelling us, is produced or reproduced through our human spirit. I'll say it again. When we live by the Spirit, Christ's righteous life, which indwells us, is reproduced through our human spirit in what we know as fruit. 
fruit. Because all those things are, you know, righteous. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. All that. That's all, that's all stuff that's quote-unquote righteous. Because it's Christ's life being reproduced through us. Okay? That's why Paul said in Galatians 2.20, It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith. And the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay? So when we live by faith, let's say, or when we live by the Spirit of God, virtual equivalents, okay, they're going to go together. What happens is Christ's life, righteous life that indwells us, is going to be reproduced in us, okay? Or through us, in our human spirit, okay? And that's, that's fruit. Now this, by the way, I think all this fruit that's produced through us, you know, people talk about loss of rewards. Uh, can you lose rewards? Can, you know, stuff like that. Um, I mean, I know some, like this type of terminology is used, but here's the thing, okay? H- however we understand this terminology, understand that if it's the fruit, if it's Christ's life reproduced through us and it's, it's fruit of the Spirit, can you destroy anything that God has done? I mean, can you? Can you obliterate anything that God has done? If God has produced something positive in this world through you, I don't think you can negate that. Like, you know, erase it. Like, it's already happened. Like, if I had the fruit of the Spirit of love toward a fellow believer, sacrificial love, that happened in history, that's always there. That's not going to go away because I do something bad five years later. (laughs) He already produced that in this world. So when I go to the judgment seat of Christ, that's going to be rewarded. Okay? The concept of loss of rewards is the concept that you missed an opportunity. You did not capitalize on an opportunity. Remember what Paul said in Ephesians 2.10? He says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works prepared beforehand that we might walk in them. Right? The whole concept is that God has laid out the opportunities for you to walk into a situation and live by the Spirit so that Christ's life is reproduced through you, right? But we don't always take those opportunities. We miss those opportunities. That's the equivalent of losing rewards because they were potential. Okay, they were potential. But anything that is ever produced through you Christ's life, is re- if it's reproduced through you, that's going to be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Nothing can negate that. You can't lose that. Okay? Because what he does is imperishable. The quality of it. It can't be destroyed. So, um, that's just a aside on rewards. But um, that's this truth, this mystery of Christ in you, is that he indwells you again in the sense that when we live by the Spirit, His righteousness that indwells us is reproduced through our human spirit in what we know as fruit. Okay? Now, this, so this Christ in you, this is a positional truth on one hand. When you live by faith or live by the Spirit, it becomes an experiential truth, right? Because then His life is really manifested through us. And this is what the mystery was in the Old Testament. Okay? Meaning something never revealed, this was not predicted. And this must have been exciting for Gentiles because, I mean, my goodness, if the Jewish Messiah is indwelling you and I Gentiles, that means that the Jewish believer doesn't have any advantage over us in this time. Okay? We're all on the same equal plane. The end of verse... As, as at the end of verse 27, Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And this means, this adds a little dimension. Uh, hope always, of course, something in the future. Glory, in this context, resurrection. So, his indwelling presence in you and his life coming through you is the hope of one day being glorified. In other words, when you see Christ's life manifested in you and you say, well, that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> okay. When you see Christ, it happens more than you think. When you see Christ's life manifested through you, you can see that fruit and you can say, "Uh huh, that's just a little pledge or down payment of a future 
glorified body. I'm going to have a resurrection body like him. So while our human, just like Romans says, while our human spirit is already alive and our body is just basically as good as dead, but we have the hope of glory and that assures us of the resurrection, future resurrection. So in verse 28, Paul comes to sum up his ministry. And what did, what did he proclaim? Well, say, let's say it better. Who did he proclaim? <laughs> we proclaim him, right? Him. We proclaim the Messiah. He is the only one he and Timothy proclaimed, okay? He's not just like the Gnostics said, you know, one on this scale, this ladder of emanations, one of these angels or something, in which case we need to proclaim them all. And Christ is among them. No, no, no. He's the only one that we proclaim because he's not on, a, on the scale, see? There's no scale, okay? He's the creator, <laughs> okay? So they proclaimed him first, it says, by admonishing every man. Admonish means to warn people, to cease some kind of conduct. And that type of conduct would have been the Gnostic conduct in this in this context. Because, you know, every theology, every doctrine, if it's the doctrine of Gnosticism, the doctrine of evolution, whatever it is, it has, it has an ethic. <laughs> okay, it has an ethic that is compatible with it. And Paul's saying, don't, you know, cease, cease that course of conduct that would follow a Gnostic worldview. Okay, it's a warning. Okay. Instead, follow Christ, right? And second, they proclaimed him, they proclaimed Christ by teaching every man. Okay, obviously, this is formal, it's formal or informal instruction. So in a, in a group like this or one-on-one, -on -one, uh, they taught Christ with respect or instructed people about Christ with respect to all wisdom. Wisdom is practical, practical knowledge, okay? Practical knowledge, useful knowledge, something you can use in your everyday life, not just theoretical stuff in your head, okay? So they warned every believer, and then admonished them, and they taught every believer okay, wisdom, practical knowledge. Why? What, what does the end of verse 28 say? Why? Why? What did Paul want to do? So that we may present every man complete in Christ. Okay. We're back to the concept of, first of all, the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> That's where you'll be presented, right? But the word complete, you know, don't translate it like that. Uh, teleon, this word, it's pretty common in the New Testament. Mature, that's what we would say in our day. Okay, mature. Mature. Yeah, that's the whole point. Paul wanted to admonish and teach practical wisdom to every believer so they could reach maturity. That's what ministry is all about. You're trying to mature, bring believers to maturity, right? Why? So that when they go to the judgment seat of Christ, they can be presented holy and blameless and beyond reproach, right? And be rewarded accordingly. So Paul was made a minister according to the stewardship from God. He wanted personally to be evaluated as being holy and blameless. And that required him to proclaim this mystery that had been given to him to Gentiles. The mystery that Christ, the Messiah, is in you. Without this truth, see, Gentiles could not really advance to spiritual maturity and get a good evaluation at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? So the name of the game is basically growing to maturity. Now, um, just one other point. If you notice in verse 28, I should have underlined it on this slide, but if you look, does everybody have a new American standard? Anybody have anything different? It's okay. Just, I want to interact with it if it's there. Uh, NIV. Well, it'll be interesting. What does the NIV say for verse 28? Okay, so it uses everyone twice, if I heard that right. Okay. Yeah, boy, I wish it could be a little bit better. Even, even the New American Standard, I wish it could be a little bit better. Because the same word, for, what do you got? Yeah, yeah, where it says complete. Oh, what version is that? Is it ESV, the English Standard Version, has mature for that word teleon. Which is, that, that makes sense to us, better than complete. Um, the, the word that was translated everyone in the NIV and is translated every and then once all in the NASB is the same word every time. You see, how many times do you see every or all in the New American Standard? We only heard it twice, every one, 
in the NIV. You should see it four times in that verse. <laughs> four times. Every, every, all, every. Okay? Well, it's the same word every time. <laughs> Did I just say that? I didn't, that's a pun. I didn't mean to do that. Um, so Paul is doing something here. We would just say, we proclaim him, admonishing it, all men and teaching all men with all wisdom so that we may present all men complete in Christ. When you put all there every time, it, it is uh, striking. Because what did, the, what did the Gnostics say? What do the Mormons say? What do the, um, what do the Masons say? It's all... You, it's the same story as Gnosticism, is that there's these levels of knowledge that you get inducted into. And only the people who go through the certain rituals or practices get to move up the ladder and get to know the, know the, the next level of information or doctrine. It's always that way. It's secret until you get initiated into the next level, you know, the 32nd level of Masons or whatever, okay? Okay. In Christianity, do you see how it's totally different on this, in this verse? All. There's no like levels, oh, you got to go through the special rituals or whatever to get this knowledge. No, no, no. Everybody has opened for them, all Christians have opened for them wisdom and being mature in Christ. That's, that's possible for all Christians. Verse 29, his, his conclusion. For this purpose, maturity... That's the purpose. I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Okay, so this is the goal again for this purpose. Paul's ministry was, notice labor, it was hard work. It takes a lot of work to train up believers to maturity, right? It's a lifetime of work. The word means toil. I mean, it's, it's toilsome. But notice how he describes how he accomplished the work that's so toilsome. Striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. That word striving is, is the word agonizamenos. We hear agonize in that because that's where we get the word from. He, it's agonizing, okay? And the word means basically to fight, to struggle. I mean, it's a fight. Paul struggled to train believers. It's a lot of work. It's hard work. But he didn't struggle, notice, in his own strength. Did he? He says the text says he struggled according to his power, the Lord's power, see? So ministry, again, it's not something we can do in our own strength, is it? It's something we can only do in his strength so that it's Christ in us, see? <laughs> that's, that's the thing. That's what Paul is getting at. So in effect, Christ's power flows through us to make our capabilities effective in training people to maturity in Christ. Okay, let's go through the summary. I'll give you, I'll pass out the summary. Uh, this is not a translation. It's, it's, uh, if it is, it's very informal. But it's to try to give the sense. So in summary, Paul reminds Gentile believers that formerly we were alienated from the Jews and their spiritual privileges. We were hostile in our minds toward God. This was manifested through our evil deeds. But now, he's reconciled us in his fleshly body through death so that ultimately, we will be presented at the judgment seat of Christ before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. That's the goal. That's what, that, that's what would happen if you're mature, right? A good evaluation at the judgment seat. But it requires that we persevere in the faith, being firmly established and steadfast, not being moved away from the hope of the gospel, which would ultimately be proclaimed to the whole world, of which Paul was uniquely made a minister at the beginning of this process. As such, he rejoiced in his sufferings on behalf of the body, as he was doing his part in filling up the suffering of the body, which was distinct from the suffering of Christ, who is the head of the body. Paul was made a minister according to a stewardship that God gave him for the church, so that he might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God to the whole world. That preaching concerns the mystery, something not revealed in the Old Testament, but now has been revealed because God wanted his great wealth to be known among the Gentiles, namely, that the Jewish Messiah was now in dwelling Gentiles, making our spirit alive and living through us as we live by faith, ensuring us of the hope of future resurrection. Messiah is the only one they proclaim because, see, he's the center of everything, right? 
He warns and he teaches every man, Paul says, practical wisdom so that every man could become mature in Christ. This is not a special group. It's, it's, it's every believer, see? This is why Paul labored and toiled in the ministry and he fought to do it according to God's power and not his own. Okay, lots of doctrines here, right? Um, judgment seat of Christ. We, we will all appear at the judgment seat of Christ, will we not? What do we want to do to have a good verdict? We want to persevere in the faith until the end, right? We want to, well, that's the second one, perseverance. The mystery, the mystery doctrine, something new that's never been revealed before. This is, this is the Messiah and Gentile, the Jewish Messiah and Gentile believers whose life is manifested through us as we live by the Spirit. Christ in you, that's what we just discussed. And uh, maturity, that's the goal, right? That's the goal, maturity. Ryrie used to say, mature, yet maturing. You know, because you never, as long as you're here, there's still more room for maturing. Just like, you know, most people are mature when they're 25, okay? But there's still more time to mature, isn't there? You're still maturing, Okay. And then striving in God's strength. See, we can't, we can't do ministry in our own strength. <laughs> and ministry is service, right? It's service. So you can't do that in your own strength. So, but you can do it in his strength. Christ in you, see? As his life's reproduced through you, then there's ministry happening. Okay. So those are some good things to reflect on. Okay. What kind of prayer requests do we have tonight before we break up? I know that, you know, a couple of mine are sick. That's why they're not here. So, yeah, I know, I know, right? <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I know. You're doing good too. Yeah, you're proving your point there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You're maturing and moving forward, right? It's good. Persevering. In his strength, yeah, I oh, know. It is a slow process, isn't it? Um, also, I know the, well, somebody's getting married. She's not here, but anyway, she's getting married pretty soon, Laura and David. And that's the, that's the second divine institution, marriage, so we need to be praying for them. It's, it's the second most important decision you'll ever make in your life. The first one is Christ. Um, yes? Yes. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. For the efficacy of the memorial service the other day, its impact on lives of unbelievers and believers. All right, gospel for unbelievers, maturity for believers. Also, uh, the Thesan, so they'll be having, uh, uh, we have a tentative date. I don't even think I got to tell you, Todd. She told me on Sunday, maybe the 10th of April. It's kind of tentative. Maybe I did tell you. I don't remember. Um, Tentatively, I think that's a Saturday. Does anybody have any conflicts with that? I don't know. Because Laura's getting married on the 3rd, right? So, yeah, I'll be there. Um, <laughs> so be praying for Melinda and the boys and everything. Okay, what else? All right. Okay, yes, Lene. Okay. Okay. Are they, are both of your friends the females, the women? Okay, one's okay. So the first one who's already married to an unbeliever, that's a she, and then the other one's a he. Okay. So a couple of Lene's friends, one already married to an unbeliever, and the other just got engaged to an unbeliever. So, obviously, in the believer's relationship, pray for his salvation. And, uh, well, always pray for salvation. Both of them <laughs> need salvation, but um, the believer needs to consider whether she should or he should be engaged to an unbeliever in the other relationship. Okay, anything else? Yeah, there's a wedding shower for Robin Thomas, not my Robin Thomas, on the 11th. How can that happen? It must be a small world. Okay. All right, let's go pray.